Fair Hippolyta, our nuptial hour draws on apace. Four happy days steep themselves in night. But oh, he thinks how slow this old moon wanes. She lingers my desire like to a stepdame or a dowager long withering out a young man's residue. Four happy nights dream away the town. Four happy days bring in a new moon. And then the new moon, new bent in heaven, shall behold the night of our solemnities. Go, Goosefrace, serve the Athenian youth to merriment. Awake the pert and nimble spirit of mirth. Hippolyta, I wound thee with my sword, and one thy love doing me injuries. But I will wed thee in another key, with pomp, with triumph, with revelry. Happy be Theseus, our renowned duke. Thanks, good Aegeus. What's the news with thee? Full of vexation come I with complaint against my child, my daughter Hermia. Stand forth, Demetrius. My noble lord, this man hath my consent to marry her. Stand forth, Lysander. <laughs> Most gracious duke, this man hath bewitched the bosom of my child. Thou, thou, Lysander, thou hast given her rhymes and interchanged love tokens with my child. Thou hast, by moonlight at her window, sung with feigned voice, verses of feigning love, and stolen the impression of her fantasy with bracelets of thy hair. Rings, gods, conceits, naps, trifles, nosegays, sweet meats, messengers of harsh prevailment in unhardened youth, and with cunning hast thou filched my daughter's heart, turned her obedience, which is due to me, to stubborn harshness, and as she is mine, I claim the ancient privilege of Athens. As she is mine, I may dispose of her, either to this gentleman or to her death, according to the law immediately provided in that case. What say you, fair Hermia, for be advised? To you, your father should be as a god, one who composed your beauties, yea, and one to leave the figure or disfigure it. Demetrius is a worthy gentleman. So is Lysander. In himself he is, but wanting with this kind, one must be held the worthier. I would my father looks but with my eyes. Rather, your mind must with his judgment look. I entreat your grace to pardon me. I know not by what power I am made bold, or how it may pardon my behavior in such a presence here, as I do plead my thoughts. But I beseech your grace that I may know the words that may befall me in this case if I refuse to end Demetrius. I will to die the death of disobedience or to abjure forever the society of men. Therefore, fair Hermia, question your desires. For whether or not you yield to your father's will, you can endure the livery of a nun to the barren sister all your life. Chanting faint hymns to the cold, fruitless moon. <laughs> So will it grow, so live, so die, my lord. Ere I will my virgin patent up unto fortune, whose unwished yoke my soul consents but to get sovereignty. Take the time to pause, for by the next new moon, the sealing day betwixt my love and me for everlasting fellowship, on that day prepare to either die the death for disobedience to your father's will, or else to wed Demetrius. Relent, sweet Hermia, and Lysander, yield thy crazy title to my certain rights. Demetrius, you have her father's love. Let me have Hermia's. Do you marry him? Scornful, Lysander. True, he hath my love, and what is mine, my love shall render him, and she is mine. And all my right of her, I do estate unto Demetrius. Mwah, mwah. My lord, <laughs> I am as well derived as he is well possessed. My love is more than his. My fortunes every way is fairly ranked, if not with vantage, as Demetrius. And what is more than all these boasts can be, I am beloved of beauteous Hermia. Therefore, why should I not prosecute my right? 
Demetrius, I will avouch it to his head. Made love to Nader's daughter Helen, oh, and won her soul. And she, sweet lady, dotes, dotes in idolatry on this spotted and inconstant man. I must confess that I have heard so much, and with Demetrius meant to have spoke thereof, but being overfull of self affairs, my mind did lose it. But, Demetrius, come! And come, Aegeus, go along. I have some private schooling for you both. As for you, fair Hermia, look you fit your fancies to fit your father's will, lest the, ye- the law of Athens yields you up. Which by no means we may extend it. Either to death or to single life. Come, my father, what cheer, my love. <gasps> <laughs> With duty and desire we follow you. <laughs> How now, my love? Why is your cheek so pale? How chance the roses there do fade so fast? You like for want of rain, which I can well but seem that from the tempest of my eyes. By me, for aught that I could ever read, could ever hear by tale or history, the course of true love never did run smooth. Either it was different in blood. Oh, cross, too high to be enthralled too low. Or else it was misgrafted in respect of years. Or spite too old to be engaged to none. Or else it stood upon the choice of friends. Oh, how to choose love by another's eyes? Oh, or, or, if there was a sympathy in choice, war, death, or sickness did lay siege to it, making it momentary as a sound, swift as a shadow, short. As any dream, quick as the lightning in the gully night, that in a spleen unfolds both heaven and earth, and ere a man the power to shut, behold, the jaws of darkness do devour it up. So quick, bright things come to confusion. If then true lovers have ever been crossed, then it stands as an edict in destiny. For let us teach our trial patience. For the customary cross is due to love as thoughts and dreams, sighs, wishes and tears, poor fancy followers. A good persuasion. Therefore, hear me, Hermia. I have a widow aunt, a dowager of great revenue, and she hath no child and respects me as her only son. There, gentle Hermia, will you marry me, and to that place the sharp Athenian law cannot pursue us. If thou lovest me, then steal forth thy father's house tomorrow night, and in the woods a leaf without the town where I did meet thee once with Helen, to do observance to the morn of May. There will I wait for thee. My good Lysander, I swear to thee by Cupid's strongest bow, by his best arrow with the golden head, by the simplicity of Venus's dust, by that which knitted souls and prospered loves, and by that fire that burned the Carthage Queen when the false Trojan under sail was seen, by all the vows that men have ever broke, in number more than women ever spoke, in that same place where thou hast appointed me, tomorrow truly will I meet with thee. Keep promise, love. Quick, here comes Helena. Good speed, fair Helena, with her away. Call you me fair? I'm fair again, unsay. Demetrius loves your fair. Happy fair, your eyes are boat star, than your tongue's sweet air, more tunable than lark to shepherd's ear. When wheat is green, when hawthorn buds appear, the sickness is catching on her favor so. First what I catch, fair Hermia, ere I go. My eye should catch your eye, my ear your voice, my tongue should catch your tongue's sweet melody. With the world mine, Demetrius being baited, the rest I give to be to you translated. Oh, teach me how you look, and with what art you sway the motion of Demetrius's heart. I frown upon him, yet he loves me still. Oh, that your <laughs> frown is to teach my smile the skill. The more I hateth, the more he follows me. The more I love, the more he hateth me. His folly, Helena, is no fault of mine. None but your beauty. Would that fault were mine. Take comfort, Helena. He no more shall see my face. Lysander and I will fly this place. Before the time I did Lysander see, Athens seems but a paradise to me. Oh, what grace does my love do dwell that he hath turned to heaven unto hell? Helen, unto you our minds we will unfold. Tomorrow night when Phoebe doth behold her silver visage in the watery glass. 
decking with liquid pearl the bladed grass, a time lover's flight still doth conceal. From Athens' gates have we devised to steal. And in the wood where often you and I, upon faint primrose beds were wont to lie, emptying our bosom of their counsel sweet, there my life, Sander, and I shall meet. And then to turn our eyes away from Athens to seek new friends and stranger companies. Farewell, sweet playfellow. Pray thou for us, and good luck grant thee thy Demetrius. Keep word, Lysander, we must starve our sight from lovers' food till tomorrow deep midnight. I will. Helena, as you unto him, Demetrius dote on you. How happy some or other some can be. But through Athens I am thought as fair as she, but what of that? Demetrius thinks not so. He will not know what all but he do know. And as he errs, stoating on Hermia's eyes, so I, admiring of his qualities, being base and vile, only no quantity loves can transpose to form and dignity. Love looks not with the eyes, but with the mind, and therefore is wing Cupid painted blind, nor hath love's mind of any judgment taste, wings with no eyes, figure unheedy haste. And therefore is love said to be a child, because in choice he is so oft beguiled as waggish boys and games themselves forswear, so the boy love is perjured everywhere. For ere Demetrius looked on Hermia's eye, he hailed down oath that he was only mine. And when this hail some heat from Hermia found, so he dissolved, and showers of oaths did melt. I will go tell him of fair Hermia's flight, unto the wood will he tomorrow night pursue her. And for this intelligence, if I have thanks, it is a dear expense. But herein mean I to enrich my pain, and to have his sight thither and back again. Is all our company here? You had best call them tenderly, man by man, according to the script. Here is the scroll with a list of the men in all of Athens thought, to fit, thought fit to play before the Duke and Duchess on their wedding day at night. Ah, uh, good, Peter Quinn. Say what that play treats on, name the rest of the actors, and so grow to a point. It is the most lamentable comedy and most cruel death of Pyramus and Thisbe. Ah, a very good play indeed. And a Mary, I assure you. Now, Peter Quint, call forth the actors by the script. Je uh, masters, spread yourselves. <laughs> Nick Bottom, the weaver. Ready. Name what part I am for and proceed. You, Bottom, must take Pyramus on you. Ah, what is Pyramus? A lover or a tyrant? It is a lover that kills himself. <laughs> Most gallant for love. Ah. <sighs> This shall ask for some tears in the true performing of it. If I do it, let the audience look into their eyes. I will restore, I will condole in some measure. Name the rest. Again, the key humor is for a tyrant. <gasps> like a play Hercules, really. Or a part to tear a cat to make all split. <gasps> the rage of box and silver and shackles will break the lock. Oh, name the rest of the actors. But that was Hercules' vein. The tyrant's vein. A lover is more condoling. Francis, flute the bellows mender. Here, Peter Quince. You, flute, must take Thisbe on you. Oh, what is Thisbe, a wandering knight? <laughs> it is the lady that Pyramus must love. <laughs> hey, faith, let me not play a woman. I have a beard to me. That is, that is all one. For you will play it in a mask and speak in a small voice. Oh. Oh, let me hide my face. Uh, let me play this beat too. I I'll speak in a monstrous little voice. This beat. This beat. Oh, dear, this beat. Oh, dear, this beat. Oh, dear, this beat. Oh, dear, this beat. No. You must play Pyramus. And flute, you this be. Well, proceed. Robin Starling, the tailor. Here, Peter Quince. You this be's mother. Tom Snap, the tinker. Oh, here, Peter Quince. You Pyramus's father. Myself, this be's father. Snug the joiner. You the lion's part. And here I think is a play well fitted. Have you the lion's part written? Pray you give it to me. I am slow. 
of study. You may do it as tempore. Let, let it me. only roaring. Uh -uh. Let me play the lion. Let me play the lion. I, I, I will roar. It's the any man's good heart will hear. I will roar. I will make the duke say, let him roar again. Let him roar again. And you would do it too terribly that it would frighten the duchess and the ladies, and that would be enough to hang us all. That, that would be enough. Every mother's son. Every mother's son. Granted, <laughs> if we were to scare the ladies out of their wits, they'd have no more discretion but to hang us. But I will aggravate my voice, and I will roar as gentle as any sucking dove. I will roar you as for any nightingale. No, you may play no part but Pyramus, for Pyramus is a sweet-faced man, a gentlemanly-like man, a man as one may find in summertime. Therefore, you must needs play pyramid. Well, I will undertake it. What beer would I best play it in? Uh, why, what you will. Hmm. Ah, I will just charge it in either your straw-colored beard, your orange swanny beard, your purple and grain beard, or your French French crown colored beard, your perfect yellow. <laughs> Some French crowns have no hair at all. Therefore, you will play a bare face. But, masters, here are your parts. Mm. I pray you, <laughs> fail me not. We will meet, and there we will rehearse. Most obscenely and courageously. Take pain, be perfect, adieu. At the Duke's oak, we meet. Enough! Hold or cut bowstring. Come <laughs> your spirits, whither wander you? Over hill, over dale, through bush, through briar, over park, over pale, and blood. Fire. I do wander everywhere. Whispers and the moon's fear. And I serve the fairy queen. To do her orbs upon the green. The cowslips tall her pension is be. In their bull's coats. But do you see? Those be rubies. Fairy favors. In their freckles live their savors. I must go see some dewdrops here. To hang a pearl in every cowslip's ear. A farewell, thou lawful spirit. We'll be gone. Our queen and all our elves come here and I. The king doth keep his rebels here tonight. Take heed the queen not come within his sight. For Oberon is passing, fell in wrath, because that she, as her attendant, hath a lovely boy, stolen from an Indian king. She never hath so sweet a changeling. And jealous Oberon would have the child, knight of his train, to trace the forest's wild. But she, perforce, withholds the loved boy, crowns him with flowers, and makes him all her joy. And now, they never meet in grove or green by fountain clear or spangled starlit sheen, but they do square that all their elves are fear. Creep into acorn cups and hide them there. <laughs> Either I mistake your shape and making quite or else you are that shrewd and needish wrinkle grubbing good fellow. Are you not he that frights the maidens of the villagery and sometimes labors in the corn? <laughs> Bootless makes the restless housewife And stir. sometimes makes the drinks to bear no more. Misclean night wanderers laughing at their hearts. <laughs> Who's that hobgoblin call you and silly pop? You do their work and they shall have good luck. Are you not he? Thou speakest to right. I am that merry wanderer of the night. I jest to Oberon, make him smile, when I, a fat, and being fed horse for God, may to light myself up, very full, oh. and sometimes look I in a gossip's bowl, in the very likeness of a roasted crab, Ugh. and when she drinks, gets her lips I bob, and on her withered do that pours the air, <gasps> the wisest aunt, telling the saddest tale sometime for a three-foot stool mistaken me, then <gasps> slip by from her bum, down topple she, and tears rise and falls into a cough, and then the whole choir hold their hips and laugh, and wax in their mirth and knees and swear, <gasps> a merrier hour was never wasted there. But room fairies, here comes Oberon. Uh, enter my mistress. What's that cheese, Oberon? Ill met by moonlight, proud to town ya. What, jealous Oberon? Fairies, skip hence. I have forsworn his bed company. Very rash wanton. Am I, I thy lord? Then I must be thy lady. <laughs> but I know when thou hast stolen away from fairyland, and in the shape of corn sat all day, playing on pipes of corn and nursing love to amorous 
Philadelphia. Why art thou here? Come from the farthest step of India. But that, forsooth, the bouncing Amazon, your buskin mistress and your warrior love, to thesis must be wedded, and you come to give their bed joy and prosperity. Canst thou thus for shame, Titania? Glance at my credit with Apollyta, knowing I know thy love for Theseus. <laughs> Didst thou not lead him through the glimmering night from Paragonia, whom he ravished? and lead him with fair English, break his faith, with Ariadne and Antiopa. These are the forgeries of jealousy, and never no. since the middle summer spring met we on him in dale, in forest, or mead, by paper fountain, or by rushy brook, or in the beach and margin of the sea, to dance our rings to the whistling wind. But with thy brawls thou hast disturbed our sport, Therefore the winds piping to us in vain, as in revenge of sucked up from the sea. Contagious fog, which, falling in the land, has every pelting river made so proud that they have overborne their continents. The oxen, therefore, stretched his yoke in vain. The plowman lost his sweat, and the green corn hath rotted ere his youth attained a beard. The fold stands empty in the drowned field and the crows are fatted with the meringue flock. <laughs> the nine of moors is filled up with mud, and the quaint mazes in the wanton green, for lack of tread, are indistinguishable. The human mortals want their winter cheer. <laughs> no night is now with him or Carol blessed. Therefore the moon, the governess of the floods, pale in her anger, washes all the air, that rheumatic diseases do abound. And through this, this temperature, we see the seasons alter. Hoary-headed frosts fall in the lap of the fresh crimson rovers, and on old hides, thin and icy crown. An odorous chaplet of sweet summer buds is as in mockery. <laughs> the spring, the summer, the shining autumn, Angry winter change their wanted liveries, and the mazed world by their increase now knows not which is which. And this same progeny of evils comes from our debate, from our dissension. We are their parents and original. Do you amend it? It lies within you. Why should Titania cross her Oberon? I do but beg a changeling child to be my henchman. Set your heart at rest! The fairyland buys not the child of me. His mother was a vultress of my order, and in the spice of Indian air by night, full often hath she gossiped by my side, <laughs> and sat with me on Neptune's yellow sands, as we marked the embarked traders of the flood where we had laughed to see the sails conceive and grow big belly with the wanton in. With she, with pretty, and with swimming gait following, her womb then, rich and admiring, <laughs> would sail upon the land, set from Cyprus, and back again as from a voyage rich with merchandise. But she, being mortal, well, that boy did die, and for her sake, I do rear up her boy, and for her sake, I will not part with him. How long in this wood intend you stay? <laughs> Perchance till after Theseus' is wedding day, if you would patiently dance in our rounds and see our moonlight revels, <laughs> go with us. If not, shun me. And I will spare your haunts. Give me the boy, and I will go with thee. <laughs> Not for thy fairy kingdom. Fairies away shall shine down right if I longer stay. <laughs> well, go thy way. Thou shalt not from this grove till I torment thee for this injury. Ah, my gentle buck, 
Come hither. Thou remember. <laughs> Thou rememberest once I sat on a promontory and heard a mermaid on a dolphin's back utter such dulcet and harmonious breath that the rude sea grew civil at her song, and the stars shot madly from their spheres just to hear the sea maid's music. I remember. That time I saw, but thou couldst not. Flying between the cold earth and the moon, Cupid, all armed, a certain aim he took, and a throne in festival by the west, and loosened his love shaft swiftly from his bow, twang, as it should pierce a hundred thousand hearts. Yet marked, yet marked I saw Cupid's fiery shaft, quenched in the chaste beams of, of the cold moon. Yet marked I the bolt of Cupid fell. It fell upon a little western flower, once milk white, now purple with love's wound, and maidens called it love in idleness. Idleness, idleness, idleness. Fetch me that flower. The herb I showed thee once, the juice of it on sleeping eyelids lay, will make all man or woman madly dote upon the next live creature that it sees. Fetch me that herb and meet me here before the Leviathan can swim a league. I'll put a girdle round about the earth in forty minutes. With this herb, I will watch the tundra while she is asleep and drop the liquor of it in her eyes. The next thing then, when waking, she looks upon, be it on lion. Bear, a wolf, or a bull, <laughs> a meddling monkey, or a <clears throat> busy ape, she shall pursue it with the soul of love. And here I take this charm from her sight, as I can take it with another herb, I will have her wet render her page to me. But who comes here? I am invisible, and I will overhear. There. Conference. I love thee not, therefore pursue me not. Where is sweet Hermia? A lysander. One I'll stay, and the other stayeth me. Thou told me they stole into this wood, and here I am wood within this wood, because I cannot meet my sweet Hermia. Now get thee gone, and follow me no more. You draw me, you hard-hearted adamant, but yet you draw not iron, because my heart is true as steel. Leave for your power to draw, and I shall have no power to follow you. Do I entice thee? Do I speak thee fair? Or do I, in plainest truth, tell you I do not, nor cannot love thee? Even for that I do love you the more. I am your spaniel, and Demetrius, the more you beat me, I will fawn on you. Use me but as your spaniel. Spurn me, strike me, neglect me, lose me. Only give me leave, unworthy as I am, to follow you. <laughs> what worse place can I beg in your love, and yet place of high respect with me than to be used as you have used your dog? <coughs> <sighs> do not tempt the hatred of my vision, for I am sick when I do look on thee. And I am sick when I look not on you. You do impeach your modesty too much. To leave the city and trust yourself to the hands of one that loves you not. To trust the opportunity of night and the ill counsel of the desert place, all for the rich worth of your virginity? Your virtue is my privilege. That it is not night when I do see your face. Therefore, I think I am not in the night. Nor does this void lack world of company. For you, in my respects, are all the world. And how can it be said that I am alone when all the world is here to look on me? I will run from thee, and, and I will hide me in the brakes. The wildest have not such a heart as you. Run when you will, the story shall be changed. Apollo flies, and Daphne holds the chase. The dove pursues the griffin, the mild hind makes speed to catch the tiger. Through the speed and cowardice pursues, and valor flies. Oh, oh. I will not stay thy questions. Oh, let me go. <laughs> and if thou do follow me, do not believe, but I will do thee mischief on this wood. I, in the temple, in the town, in the field, you do me mischief. Hi, Demetrius, your wrongs do set a scandal on my sex. 
We should not fight for love as men may do. We should be wooed if we're not made to woo. I'll follow thee and make a heaven of hell to die upon the hand I love so well. Fare thee well, nymph. Ere he do leave this grove, thou shalt fly him, and he shall seek thy love. Hast thou the flower there? Well done, wanderer. Aye, there it is. I pray thee, give it. I pray thee, give it. I pray thee, give it me. I know a place where Tanya sleeps at the night, lulled in the flowers with dances and delight. And with the juice of this, I will streak her eyes make her full of hateful fantasies. Take thou some of this and seek through this grove. A sweet Athenian lady is in love with a disdainful youth. Anoint his eyes, but do so when she does spy. Maybe a woman. Thou shalt know the man by the <clears throat> Athenian garments he hath on. And meet me here the first cock crow. Fear not, my lord. Your servant shall do so. Come, a round roll in a fairy song. And then, for the third part of a minute hence, some to kill cankers in the musk rose buds, some to war with rarer mice for their leathery wings to make my small elf coats, and some to keep back the glamorous owl that nightly hoots and wonders in our quaint spirits. Sing me now asleep, then to your offices, and let me Rest. Go in the tents, Oase. Now all is well. What else will stand such a bell? What thou seest when thou dost wake, do it for thy true love's take. Love and languish for his sake. Be it on ounce, or cat, or bear. Part of boar with bristled hair. Awake. And some vile things near. Fair love, you faint with wandering in the wood, and to speak troth, I have forgot our way. Full rest is Hermia, if you think it good, and tarry for the comfort of the day. Be it so, Lysander. Find you out of bed, for I upon this maple rest my head. <clears throat> one turf shall serve as pillow for us both, one heart, one bed, and a single throat. Eh, 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 good Lysander. For my sake, my dear, fly further off, do not lie so near. Oh, sweet, take the sense of my innocence. Love takes the meaning in love's conference. I mean, my heart unto yours is knit, so that one heart we can make of it. Two bosoms interchanged with an oak, so two bosoms and a single trope. Therefore, no bedroom by your side me deny, for lying so hermia. I do not lie. Lysander riddled very prettily. How much for shrew my manners and my pride if Hermia meant to say Lysander lied. But for love and courtesy, lie further off in human modesty. Such separation as may becomes a virtuous bachelor and a maid. So far be distant, and good night, sweet friend. Thy love ne'er alter till thy sweet life end. Amen, amen to that fair prayer, say I, and I end life before I end loyalty. Here is my bed. Sleep, give thee all his rest. And then hath that wish the wisher might be pressed. Through the forest have I gone, but Athenian found I not, on whose eyes I might approve this flower's force in stirring love. Who's there in silence? silence? Who is here? Beats of Athens he doth wear. This is he, my master said, despiseth the Athenian maid. And here the maiden, sleeping sound on this dank and dirty ground. Pretty soul. She durst not lie near this lack love, this kill courtesy. <laughs> Churl, upon thy eyes I throw all the power this charm doth owe. When thou wakest, let love forbid. Sleep his seat on thy eyelid. So, awake when I am gone, for I must now to Oberon! Hey, wilt thou kill me, sweet Demetrius? I charge thee hence, and do not haunt me thus! Oh, wilt thou darkly leave me? Do not so! Stay.
stay on thy peril. I alone shall go. Oh, I am out of breath in this fond chase. The more my prayer, the lesser is my grace. Happy is Hermia, wheresoe'er she lies, for she hath blessed and attractive eyes. How came her eyes so bright? Not with salt tears, if so, my eyes are oftener washed than hers. No, no, I am as ugly as a bear, for beasts that need me to run away for fear. Therefore, no marvel, Demetrius, dear, why the monster fly my presence thus. What wicked and disassembling glass of mine made me compare with Hermia's spirit mind? Who is here? I stand her on the ground. Set her asleep. See no blood, no wound. My standard, if you live, good sir, awake. And run through fire I will for thy sweet sake. Transparent Helena, nature shows art that through thy bosom leads me to thy heart. But where is Demetrius? Oh, how fit a word is that vile name to perish on my sword! Do not say so, Lysander, say not so. What though he love your Hermia, Lord, what though? If Hermia still loves you, then be content. Content with Hermia? <laughs> no. I do repent the tedious minutes I with her have spent. Not Hermia, but Helena I love, who would not change a raven for a dove. The will of man is by his reason swayed, and reason says you are the worthier maid. Things growing are not right until their season, and I, being young, right now not to reason. But touching the point of human skill, reason becomes the marshal to my will and leads me to your eyes. Where I o'erlook love's stories written in love's richest book. Wherefore was I to this king mockery born? When in your hands did I deserve this scorn? Is it not enough? Is it not enough, young man, that I did never, no, nor never can, deserve a sweet look from Demetrius' side? But you must flat my insufficiency! Good trope, you do me wrong, could suit you do, and in such a disdainful manner me to woo. Of course, I must confess, I thought you, Lord, of more true gentleness. How can a lady of one man refuse of another, therefore, be a few? She sees not, Hermia, my surfeit, my heresy, hated of all, but the most by me. And with all my power, address your love and might, to honor Helen and to be her knight. Help me, Lysander. Help me. Do thy best to pluck this crawling serpent from my breast. I need for pity. What a dream was here. <coughs> Look, Lysander, how I do quake with fear. He thought a serpent ate my heart away, and you stopped smiling at his cruel prey. Lysander! What, removed? <laughs> Lysander! Lord? What, out of hearing gone? No sound? No word? Let, where are you? Speak, and if you hear, speak of all loves. I, I swoon almost with fear. <laughs> no? Well, I perceive thee all not nigh. Either death or you, I will find immediately. Are we all met? Pat, Pat, and here's a marvelous convenient place for us to rehearse. This grassy knoll shall be our stage, that Hawthorne brave our tiring house, and we shall do it in action as we will do it before the Duke. Uh, dear Quinz. What sayest thou, bully bottom? There are some things in this comedy of Pyramus and Thisbe that will never please. First, Pyramus must draw a sword and kill himself. Which, uh, the ladies not abide. <laughs> <laughs> How answer you that? By the way, give a part of the spear. We must leave all the killing out when all is done. Ah, not a witch. I have a device to make all well. Write me a prologue. 
And let this prologue seem to say that we do no harm with our swords. And, for better assurance, tell them that I, Pyramus, am not Pyramus, but Bottom the Weaver. This shall put them out of fear. Well, it shall be done, and it shall be written in eight and six. No, no, let it be two more. Let it be written in eight and eight. Oh, will not the ladies be afeard of the lion? Oh. I fear it, I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> Master, you ought to consider with yourselves to bring in God shield us. A lion amongst ladies is a most dreadful thing, for there is no more fearful wildfowl than your lion lived. We ought to look to it. Therefore, another prologue must tell he is not a lion. Ah. Nay, you must name his name, and half his face must be seen through the lion's neck, and he himself must say through, or sing thus, or to the same effect. Ladies, fair ladies, I wish you would. I grant you, I entreat you, not to fear, not to tremble, my life for yours. If I come hitherto as a lion, twere pity on my life. And then he must name his name and say thus that he has snugged the joiner. Well, if that may be, then all is well. But there are two hard things. That is, to bring in moonshine into the chamber. For it says that Pyramus of Thisbe did meet by moonshine. Just the moonshine, that might be player play. <gasps> a calendar! A calendar! Look in the almanac! Find out moonshine! Find out moonshine! Through bog, through bush, through brake, through briar. 
Sometime a horse I'll be, sometime a hound, a hog, a headless bear, sometime a fire, and neigh, and bark, and grunt, and roar, and burn. Like horse, hound, hog, bear, fire at every turn. Why did they run away? This is a knavery to make me a beard. Uh, this is your worship's name? 
Mustard seed. Ah, good Master Mustard seed, I know your patience well. That same cowardly giant like beef, ox beef, hath devoured many a gentleman of your house. I, 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 I <laughs> promise you your kindred hath made my eyes water ere now. I desire you of more of acquaintance, good Master Mustard Seed. Come. Wait upon him. Lead him to my bower. The moon, methinks, looks with a watery eye. And when she weeps, weeps every little <laughs> flower lamenting some enforced chastity. Tie up my love's tongue. Bring him silently. <laughs> I wonder if Titania be awake. Then what it was next that came in her eye, which she must dote on in extremity. <laughs> Here comes my messenger. <laughs> How now, mad spirit? What not will be on this haunted grove? My mistress with a monster is in love. <gasps> Near to her close and consecrated bower, while she was in her dull and sleeping hour, a crew of patches, rude mechanicals, who worked for bread upon Athenian stalls, were met together to rehearse a play. Intended for great Theseus's nuptial day. The shallowest, thick skin of that barren sword, who pyramids presented in their sword, forsook his scene and entered in a break, when I had him at this advantage take. An ass is no life fixed on his head. Oh no, he sees we must be emperor. And for mine, and it comes, when they him spy as wild geese that the creeping fowler eye, or russet padded shouts, many in sword, rising and pawing at the gun's report, sever themselves and never sweep the sky. So, at his sight, away his fellows fly, and at our stand, hero or no one, falls he, murder, ah, cries and help the mouth and fall. Their sense the sweet lust, their sense the strong maid, senseless things begin to do them wrong. For briars and thorns at their apparel snatch, some sleeves, some hats, from yielders all things catch. I led them on in this distracted fear and left sweet pyramids translate there. <laughs> when in that moment. <laughs> so it came to pass. To time you wait. <laughs> and straight away loved an ass. <laughs> this falls out better than I could divine. <laughs> but hast thou watch the Athenian gods as I did bid thee do? I took him sleeping. That is finished too. And the Athenian woman by his side, that of force, when he is waked, she must be eyed. Stand close. This is that same Athenian. This is the woman, but not this the man. <laughs> oh, why rebuke you him that loves you so? You should lay breath so bitter on a bitter foe. Now I but chide, but I should use thee worse. For thou hast given me cause to curse that thou hast slain Lysander in his sleep. Then Lord shares his blood and pleasure that he can kill me too. The sun was so untrue unto the day as he to me. Would he have stolen away from sleeping Hermia? I'll believe as soon as this whole earth may be born that the moon through the center creep with her brother's new type with the Antipodes. It cannot be but thou hast murdered him. So should a murderer look so dead, so grim. And so the murdered should look, and so should I, pierced through the heart with such stern cruelty. And yet you, the murderer, look as bright as clear as yonder Venus in her glimmering sphere. What is this to my Lysander? Where is he? Good Demetrius, will thou give him me? I should rather give his carcass to my hounds. Out, John, out, cur! Now I pray to be past the mouth of man's patience. Hast thou slain him then? Henceforth never be numbered among men. Tell true, tell true, even for my sake. Durst thou look upon him being awake, and hast thou killed him sleeping? A brave touch. Could not an adder, a worm, do so much? An adder did it, for with double tongue than thine, thou serpent, never adder stung. I am not guilty of Lysander's blood, nor is he dead, for aught I can tell. I pray thee, then, tell me that he is well. And if I do, what should I get then, therefore? <laughs> a privilege, never to see me more. And from thy hated presence I part so. See me no more, whether he be dead or no. 
There is no following her in this fierce vein. Therefore here I shall remain. For in sorrow's heaviness does sorrow grow. For debt and bankrupt sleep doth sorrow owe. And in some slight measure it shall pay. And with this tender, here I'll make my stay. <laughs> what hast thou done? <laughs> thou hast mistakest quite <laughs> and laid the love juice on some true cups. Fine, prison must be forced in sue, now the true love turn, and out of false turn true. Then fatal rules that one man holding true, a million fail, confounding all. Oh, no. <laughs> the woods go swifter than the wind. And Helena of Athens, look thou aside, all fancy sick and pale of cheer, with sighs of love that cost the fresh blood dear. <laughs> By thy impression, look thou bring her here, I will charm his eyes against she do appear. I go, I go, look how I go, swifter than the air up in the tartar bow. <laughs> Flower of this purple dye, Hit with Cupid's archery, sink an apple of his eye, by his love he doth espy. Let her shine as gloriously as the Venus of the sky. If thou shalt wake, if she be by, beg for remedy. Captain of a very bad hell and I hear it And the youth mistook by me pleading for a lover's feet. Shall we their fond pageancy lord? What will these mortals be? And aside, the noise they make will cause Demetrius to awake. Then we'll do it once we want. That must needs be sport alone. And those things do best please me, that the fall preposterously. <laughs> Why should you think that I should woo and scorn? Scorning derision never came in tears. Look, when I vow, I weep and vow so born in their nativity all truth appears. How can these things in me seem scorn to you? Bearing the badge of faith to prove them true. I do advance your cunning more and more, when truth tells truth. Oh, devilish holy frame, these vows are Hermia's. <laughs> Lay oath with an oath, and you will nothing weigh. Your vows to her and me, put in two scales, will even weigh. Both as light as tails. I, I had no judgment when to her I swore. You were not in my mind now, you give her o'er. Demetrius loves her, and he loves not you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Helena, goddess, nymph, perfect divine, to what my love shall I compare thine eye? Crystal is mine, oh, and do show thy tempting cherries, those kissing lips tempting show. Pure congealed white tide Taurus the snow, fan with eastern wind turns to crow. Oh, give me thy hand, this seal of bliss, this princess of pure white, this seal of bliss. <laughs> <laughs> Lysander, keep thy love. 
I will none. Ere I loved Hermia, that love is gone. My heart, like a guest wise sojourned to Helena, it has returned. <coughs> there, to remain, Helen, it is not so. <laughs> Lysander, do not scorn love, love that thou dost not understand, or thou shalt abide it. Here comes thy love, yonder is thy dear. Dark night, but from the eye function takes thee, ear more quick of apprehension makes, wherein it doth impair the seeing sense, it pays the hearing du double recompense. Not by my eye, Lysander found, but my ear, I think it brought me to thy sound. But why unkindly dost thou leave me so? Why should he say whom love doth buy to go? What love could press Lysander from my sight? Lysander's love. Fair Helena, who more gilds the night than all your fiery eyes and o's of <laughs> Why seekest thou me? Can't this make it known? Leave <laughs> 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 thee so. You speak not as you think it cannot be. Lo, she is one of the Thou burr, vile thing, let loose, or I will seek 
be from me like a serpent. Why have you grown so rude? What changes this sweet love? Thy love? Out, tawny tabby, out! Vile medicine, loathed potion, hence! Do you not jest? Yes, sooth, and so do you. Demetrius, I will have my word with thee. I would if I had your bond, for I pursue, oh, perceive a weak bond holds thee. I will not trust thy word. What should I? Hurt her? Strike her? Kill her dead? Though I hate her, I will not do as such. What can do me more harm than hate? Hate me? Wherefore? Am I not Hermia? Are you not Lysander? I am as fair now as I was in a while. <laughs> that I do hate thee, and love Helena. Oh, me. You juggler! You came from love, and you made from love! What have you come by night and stolen my love heart from him? By his face! Have you no modesty, no maiden shame, no touch of bashfulness? Want to you tear impatient answers from my gentle tongue? Why, fie, you counterfeit, you puppet, you. Puppet? Why so? I that way goes the game, nor I perceive she hath urged her stature, and with her personage, her tall personage, her height forsooth she hath prevailed with him. And are you grown so high in his esteem, because I am so dwarfish and so low? How low am I, thou painted maypole? Speak! How low am I? I'm not so low that my nails cannot reach into thine eyes! I pray you! Now commit 
Yes, I may agree. Will Fully! Believe me, King of Shadows, I mistook. Did not you tell me I should know the man by the Athenian garments he had on? And so far, blameless for my enterprise, that I have anointed an Athenian's eyes. And so far, I am glad I did the sword for all this third day, like I am even floor. Thou seest, these lovers seek a place to fight. I therefore, Robin, overcast the night. And leave these testy rivals so astray as not one come in another's way. Till thou with their brows death counted in sleep, with leaden legs and fatty wings doth creep. And crush this herb into Lysander's sight, and make his eyeballs roll with wanted delight. When they next wake, all this derision shall seem like a dream and fruitless vision. Then to my eyes Titania shall release from monsters' view, and everything will be. My very lord, this must be done with haste, for night swift dragon cut the clouds full fast. And yonder shines Aurora's harbinger, at whose approach ghosts wandering here and there troop home to churchyards, damned in spirits all, that in crossways and floods already to their wormy graves are gone. For fear, lest day should look their shame upon, they will flee themselves exile from the light, and for I must consort with black brown night. <laughs> but we are spirits of a dead sort. Oh! Yet with high with morning's love have all made sport. Uh. But in haste, make no delay, we may affect this business right ere day. Up and down, up and down, I will lead them. Up and down. I am feared in field and down. Goblin lead them up and down. Here comes one. <laughs> Where art thou, proud Demetrius? Speak thou now! Here, villain, drawn and ready, where art thou? I will be with thee straight! Follow me then to plainer grounds. Lysander, art thou fled? Thou runaway? Thou coward? Where dost thou hide thy head? Where art thou now? Thou coward, art thou bragging to the stars, telling the bushes that thou lookest for wars and wilt not come? Come, recreant. Come, thou child. I'll whip thee with a rock. He is the fire that draws a sword on thee. Yea, art thou there? Follow my voice. We'll try no manhood here. He goes before me and still dares me on. I come where he calls, and then he is gone. The villain is much lighter heeled than I. I followed fast, but faster did he fly. Ooh. Now fallen and I in dark, uneven way. Here will rest me. Come, thou gentle day, for by thy great light I find Demetrius, I'll avenge this spite. Oh, 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 God, why comes thou not? Abide me if thou darest, for well I wot. Running through this forest, shifting from place to place, never standing still, nor looking me in the face? Where art thou now? Come hither, I am here. Nay, then thou mockest me. You shall buy this, dear, if by ever I by daylight see. Now go thy way. <sighs> now faintness seemeth constraineth me. Here I lay my length on this cold bed and hope by daylight to be. This is Ted. Oh, weary night, how oh, long and tedious night, a great by hours. Shine comforts from the east that I may back to Athens by daylight from these that my poor company detest. And sleep that sometimes shuts up sorrows, I steal me a while from my own company. Yet but three. Come one more, two of both times make up four. Here she comes, cursed and sad. Cupid is a knavish lad. <laughs> Thus to make four females mad. Never so weary. <laughs> Never so in woe. <laughs> the dabbled in the doing, torn with briars. I can no further crawl, can no further go. My legs cannot keep pace with my desires. Here I will rest me until the break of day. Heavens, shield Lysander, if they mean a fray. On the ground sleep sound. 
I'll apply to your eye gentle of a remedy. <clears throat> when thou wakest, thou takest true delight in the sight of thy former lady's eye. And the country proverb known that every man should take his own. In their waking shall be shown. Jack shall have Jill, not shall go ill. The man shall have his American, and all shall be well. Come, sit thee down upon this flowery bed, while I, thy amiable cheek, do coy, and stick musk roses in thy sleek, smooth head, and kiss thy fair large ears. My gentle joy. Where is Peas Blossom? Frank. Scratch my head, Peas Blossom. Where is Monsieur Cobweb? <laughs> Good, Monsieur Cobweb. Good, Monsieur. Get your weapons in hand and kill me a red hipped humblebee on top of a thistle. Where is Monsieur Mustard Seed? Ready. Give me your niece, Monsieur Mustard Seed. I pray you keep your courtesy to yourself, good Monsieur. What is thy will? Nothing, good Monsieur, but to aid Cavalier Cobweb to scratch. Mm. I must to the barbers, Monsieur, and methinks I am marvelous hairy about the face. <laughs> I am a tender ass. If my hair do tickle me, I must scratch. What, wilt thou hear some music, my sweet love? I have a good ear for music. Let us have the tongs and the bones. Or sayest what thou desirest to eat. Truly a peck of provender. <laughs> I could munch on your good dry oats. I have a great desire for a bottle of hay. Good hay. Sweet hay. Hath no fellow. I have a venturous fairy that shall seek the squirrel's hoard and fetch thee new nuts. I'd rather have a handful of two of dried peas. <laughs> <laughs> Let your people stir me not. I have an exposition to sleep about me. Sleep thou, and I will wind thee in my arms. Oh, how I love thee. Oh, how I dote on thee. Welcome to the Robin. Thou seest this sweet sight. For dotage I now do begin to pity. For seeking your of life behind this wood. Seeking sweet favors for this <laughs> hateful fool. I did upbraid her and fall out with her. <laughs> and when I had it my pleasure, I taunt, taunted her. And she in turn begged me for my patience. I then did ask her for her changeling child. And now I have the boy! <laughs> so I will undo this hateful imperfection of her eyes. And, gentle Puck, take this transformed scalp from off the head of this Thedian swain. Aw. First, <laughs> I will release the fairy queen. Seest thou want to see? Beest thou was wont to be, Diane's bud or Cupid's flower, hath such force and blessed power. <laughs> and now, my Titania, awake you, my sweet. <laughs> <laughs> my Oberon. Whoa. <laughs> what visions have I seen? We thought I was enamored of an ass. <laughs> Be. What did the Theseus 
on in Java T. Fairy King, attend Mark. I do hear the morning lark. Then my queen is silent and sad. Trip we after the night shade. We the globe do come this soon. Swifter than the wandering moon. Come, my lord, and in our flight, tell me how we came this night that I, sleeping here, was found with these mortals on the ground. Go, one of you, find out the bar, sir. We will fair queen up to the mountain's top and mark the echo of hounds as we echo in confusion. <clears throat> I was with Hercules and Cadmus once, when in a wooden creek they bathed the bear with hounds of Sparta. Never did I hear such gallant chiming, so sweet a discord, so musical a thunder. <laughs> My hounds are bred of the Spartan kind. Never was a cry more hollow to, nor judge with cheer or horn. Judge when you hear. But off, what news are these? My lord, this is my daughter asleep here. This Lysander, this Demetrius is, this Helena, old Nader's Helena. I wonder at them being here together. No doubt they rose early in observers of the morn of day, and in hearing our intent came here in grace of solemnities. But come it is. Is this not the day that Hermia must give answer of her choice? My lord, it is. Go, bid the huntsman wake them with their horns. <whistles> Good morrow, friends. St. Valentine is fast. Begin these wood birds, but to couple now. Pardon, lord. I pray you all stand up. I know you two are rival enemies. How comes such gentle concord in the world? That hatred may fear no jealousy to sleep by hate and fear no enmity. My lord, I, I must reply amazingly, half sleeping, half wake, but as yet I cannot truly say how I came to be here. But as I think for truly I would speak and bethink me, so it is, I came with Hermia hither. Our intent to be from Athens, where we might, without the peril of the Athenian law. Enough! Enough, my lord, you have enough. I claim the law, the law upon their heads. They would have stolen away Demetrius, they would, and thereby defeated you and me, you of your wife, me of my consent, of my consent that she should be your wife. Uh, my lord, uh, fair Helen did tell me of their stealth that they did hither unto this wood, and I in fury did hither follow, and Helen in fancy did follow me, and my love to Helen is like a melted snow in remembrance of an idle god. See. My love to Helena was true, ere I saw Hermia, but in sickness did I loathe that taste. Uh, but now <laughs> I am returned to my natural taste, and now I do wish it, love it, long for it, and will forevermore be true to it. Fair lovers, you are fortunately met. More of this discourse we will hear anon. Jesus, I will overbear your will. For in the temple, by and by with us, these lovers shall eternally be knit. Away with us to Athens. Three and three will hold a feast in great solemnity. Come and follow it up. <laughs> these things seem indistinguishable to me, like mountains turn it into far off clouds. He thinks I see these things with parted eye when everything seems double. Tell me, Fix, and I have found Demetrius like a jewel, mine own and not mine own. Are we not still asleep, or, or did we wake? Was the Duke not just here, and did he not bid us follow him? Yea, <laughs> and my father, and Palatine? And they did bid us follow to the temple. Then we must be awake. Let us go, and along the way we shall recount our dreams. When my dude comes, call me, and I'll answer it. My next is what for Pyramus, I hope. Peter Quince. Flute, the bellows mender. <coughs> Snout, the tigger. Startling. My God, stolen hens and left asleep. I've had the most rare vision. 
Hayek had a dream past the wit of any man to say what that dream was. A man is but an ass if he's to expound upon that dream. <laughs> me thought I was, no man can say what. Me thought I was and me thought I had. <sighs> But, 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 man, but a part school if used to say what we thought I was. <laughs> the eyes of man doth not hear. The ears of man doth not see. Man's hands do not taste his tongue to conceive, nor his heart to report what my dream was. I will have Peter Quinn's write a ballad of this dream. This should be called Bottom's Dream, because it hath no bottom. <laughs> and I will sing it at the end of a play before the Duke. Peradventure, I will sing it at her death.
say? What masks have you for us this evening? What music? There is a brief how many sports are right. Make choice of which your highness will see first. The battle of the centaur, sung by an Athenian eunuch to the harp. Will none of that. The riot of the tipsy bacchanals. That is an old device. <laughs> the thrice three muses, longing for the death of knowledge, late deceased in beggary. That is some keen satire. Keen, critical, not sorting with the nuptial ceremony. The tedious brief scene of young Fairmiss and lovely lady Thespe, married tragical mirth. <coughs> tedious and brief, Mary and tragical. That is some hot ice, wondrous strange snow. How shall we find the concord of this discord? A play there is, my lord, some ten words long, which is as brief as I have known a play, but by ten words, my lord, <clears throat> it is too long. For in all the play, there is not one word apt, one play of fitted, and tragical, my noble lord, it is for <clears throat> dear Miss Therendon, kill himself, which, when I saw rehearsed, I must confess, did make mine eyes water. But more merry tears the passion of loud laughter never shed. Who are they that do play it? Hard-handed men that work in Athens here, which never labored in their minds till now, and now have toiled their unbreathed memories with this same play against your nuptial. And we will hear it! No, my noble lord, it is not for you! I have heard it over, and it is nothing. Nothing in the world, unless you can find sport in their intent, extremely stretched, and calm to cruel pains to do you service. We will hear that play, for never can anything be amiss when duty and sinfulness tender it. Go, lead them in. And ladies, take your places. I love not to see wretchedness or charge in faith of his duty perishing. Why, gentle sweet, you shall see no such thing. He says they can do nothing in this kind. Why, then, my love, it shall be our sport to give them thanks for nothing. Our duty shall be to take what they mistake. Love, therefore, in tongue-tied simplicity, in least speak most to my capacity. So please, Your Grace, the prologue is addressed. Let him approach!
In this same interlude, it doth befall that I would snub by name present a wall. At such a wall as I would have you think that had in it a cranny hole or chick through which the lovers Pyramus and Thisbe did whisper, often very secretly, this low, this rough cast, this stone doth show that I am that same wall. The truth is so, and this the cranny is right and sinister, through which the fearful lovers are to whisper. Would you desire lime and hair to speak better? It is the very best wall of discourse I ever did hear, my lord. Silence! Here, Miss Jones, near the wall. Oh, oh, grim looked knight. Oh, knight with hue so black. Oh, knight, whenever our day is not. Oh, knight. Oh, night, alack, 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 I fear my Thisbe's promise is forgot. Oh, wall, oh, lovely, oh, sweet wall, that stands between her father's land and mine. <laughs> oh, wall, oh, sweet and lovely wall, show me thy chink in which to blink with mine eye. Thanks, courageous wall. Jove shall do well. <laughs> but what see I? No, this be do I see. Oh, wicked wall, for whom I see no bliss. Curse be thy stones for thus deceiving me. The wall being sensible, we think, should curse again. No, sir, she may not. Deceiving me is Thisbe's cue. I am to spy her through the wall, and she is to come. You'll see. It'll, it'll fall just as I said. Yonder she comes. Oh, wall! So often hast thou heard my moans for parting my fair Pyramus and me. These lily lips have often kissed thy stones, <gasps> thy stones with lime and hair knit up in thee. I see a voice. Now to the chink in which to see my Thisbe face. Thisbe! My love, I think! Think with thy wilt. I am thy lover's grace, as Lymander's trusty still. And I, like Helen, do the fates me kill. Ah, uh, no shackless to Procreus was so true. As shackless to Procreus I to you. Oh, kiss me through the vile chink of this wall. Uh, I kiss the wall's home, not your lips at all. Wilt thou meet me at Ninny's tomb? Ninny! Yes, yes, straight away. Tide life, tide death. I'll come without delay. Thus have I wall my part discharged so, and being done, thus wall away, doth go. Now is the mural down between the two neighbors. <laughs> no wonder, my lord, when walls do listen without warning. This is the silliest stuff that ever I heard. <laughs> <laughs> that has come to noble beast in a man and the lion. You ladies. You whose gentle hearts do fear the smallest monstrous mouse that creeps on floor. Now I know that perchance and both quake and tremble here. While, while, the, swath, while the swath rage doth roar, know that I have snugged a joiner, and no lion fell, nor else no lion dam. For if I should come in strife into this place, for pity on my life, very gentle beast of good conscience. He is the very best of beast that I ever saw. The lion is a very fox for his valor. True, and the goose for his discretion. But his discretion does not carry his valor. Then let us leave it to his discretion, then, and let us listen to the moon. <laughs> This lanthorn doth the horned moon present. He should have worn those horns on his head. Indeed. He is no crescent, and his horns are invisible within the circumference. <clears throat> this lanthorn doth the horned moon present. I, the man in the moon, do This is the greatest error of them all. The man should be put into the lanthorn. Otherwise, how else is it the man in the moon? The man should not come for the lanthorn or the candle, my lord, for the candle is already in snuff. I am aware of 
heart of their fathers is down. Huh. Would it please you to, to see an epilogue? No. Or, or to hear a burglar match game for two of our company? No epilogue, I pray you. For your play needs no excuse. Let your epilogue alone. The iron tongue of midnight hath told twelve. Lovers, to bed. Tis almost very hot. I fear this palpable gross play hath well beguiled the heavy gate of night. Sweet friends, to bed. A fortnight we hold this solemnity. In nightly revels a new jollity. <gasps> Now the hungry lion roars, and the wolf behowls the moon, whilst the heavy plowman snores, all the weary tasks for time. Now the wasted brands we blow, whilst the screech owl, screeching loud, puts the wretch that lies in woe in remembrance of a shroud. Now it is the time of night, at the graves all gaping wide, every one puts forth his sprite in the churchway paths to glide. And we fairies, that to run by the triple Hecate's team from the presence of the sun, Chasing darkness like a dream now our frolic. Not a mouse shall disturb this hallowed house. I am sent with broom before to sweep the dust behind the door. And through this house give glimmering light by the dead and drowsy fire. Every old from fairy sprite, hop as light as bird from briar. And this little ditty after me, sing and dance it trippingly. First rehearse your song by rote. Word by word, a warbling note. Hand in hand, in fairy grace, shall we sing and bless this place. Now until the break of day, in this house each fairy stray, and the owner of it bless, ever shall in safety rest. Trip away, make no stay, meet, meet me all by break. If we shadows have offended, think but this, and all is meant, that you have but slumber here, while these visions did appear, and this weak and idle theme, no more yielding, but a dream. Gentles, do not reprehend. If you pardon, we will mend, and as I am an honest puck, if we have unearned luck now to escape the serpent's tongue, we will make amends ere long, or else the puck a liar call. So, good night unto you all. Give me your hands if we be friends, and Robin shall restore amen.